was quite good. <laughs> Amen? Woo, man. So uh, my name is Mark Beebe. I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. And uh, man, I love being here. I love being in this place. And I love being able to serve God in every way that I can. I, I, one of the things I do is work with recovery ministries. And um, man, I've seen a lot of miracles happen in that place on Thursday nights and a lot of other nights as well. And if you know people that are 
Maybe, maybe you are. If, if someone you know or you is struggling with something bigger in your life than you, I would really encourage you to um, come and be a part of what we're doing on Thursdays. You're, you're probably gonna find it a little bit, maybe just a little bit awkward for a little while, but I, you're gonna discover one of the most loving, encouraging places you're, you're probably ever gonna get to be a part of. And um, I'm glad for that opportunity. We're gonna start a new series that we're calling Walk This Way, and it has to do with not, um, not doing anything to avoid the work of God in our lives, letting God do what God's gonna do with no shortcuts. And um, that's, a big, that's a big challenge for us because we would kind of love in a lot of ways to find the easier way out, right? That would be like one of our human nature things is we'd be okay with the idea of finding an easy way out. Let's pray. Sweet Jesus, thank you so much for this time for the opportunity to be together, for the opportunity to be in your love and your spirit. We ask that you open us up wide to what you wanna share with us. In your sweet name we pray, amen. So one of the first things that Jesus did in his public ministry, which it's kinda like, it's hard kinda for me to imagine Jesus not doing ministry all the way up into his, into his 30s, but you know that was happening the whole way, but when he declared this is, this is gonna be an event, you know, where I'm gonna do something completely unique in the, in the last chapter of my life for God. One of the first things he does is he goes off on retreat. He goes out into the desert, he goes out into the wilderness, and of all the people he's gonna spend time with, he's gonna spend time with the enemy. And like, you had to know that Jesus knew that the enemy was gonna show there, right? You had to know that in a difficult place, in a difficult time, the enemy is gonna show up. Tell me that's not true for us. Tell me that's not the way it is for us, right? Tell me that it's not true that when we are really struggling, we have the enemy in our ear basically going, where is God? Is God really showing up for you? Why does God not really love you the way he's supposed to? Why isn't God taking care of you? Why isn't God protecting you? Tell me that's not true for us, right? The same thing is going on exactly with Jesus. And we're gonna get into that, um, we're gonna get into that piece of, of the story today. Matthew chapter four, this is what it says. Then Jesus was led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. For 40 days and 40 nights, he fasted and became very hungry. During that time, the devil came and said to him, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. Prove that God is gonna give you what you believe you need, right? You've heard that before, haven't you? You need to make God basically prove it. We're gonna keep hearing that. If you are the son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him no. The scriptures say people do not live by bread alone, but by every word, that comes from the mouth of God. So the deal with us is the short view of how we're gonna live with God becomes the long view of how we're gonna live with God, how we can live with God, when we give up our vision of how we think life ought to go for God's vision. You know, like I spent some time teaching down at the Knoxville Area Rescue Mission, and one of the things I was doing down there was getting into a, a quick little course on um, on experiencing God. This is a book written by Henry, Henry Blackaby. And so I was talking to them, kind of going, so like when we're talking about the will of God, what do, what do you think would happen if I said that um, God, I believe that God was calling me to a ministry in China? And they're like, you know, I don't know. I'm like, well, I know what would happen. So the first thing that would happen is my wife, Carol, would go, there is no possible way I'm commuting from China. And so have a very good day. That's what would happen. She, she would like, deny that, but I'm telling you, in her heart of hearts, that's what's gonna happen, right? She would say, okay, but it literally wouldn't be okay. There's so many other things about what I would be challenged to do that if I were to give God free reign in my life, I would be very uncomfortable doing, right? There's so many other things that would create great discomfort for me. What would happen if we gave God our vision and said, do with what you want us to do with our lives the way you wanna do it, God, what do you think would happen? The short becomes the long when we do exactly that. 
when we get into this conversation like about bread, we gotta, we gotta think hard about what bread is. Bread isn't bread, right? Bread has nothing to do. Bread has nothing to do with bread. There's no like higher quality bread, super bread. There, like my daughter spends, um, I think about $800 on bread, on Dave's famous bread. It's freaking unbelievable like how much she'll spend on it. You're shaking your head going, I get that bread. You shouldn't, it's wrong. Don't ever get it again. <laughs> Take it off your shelf, throw it away. For heaven's sakes, woman, what are you doing? We need the $6 here. No, just kidding. But I mean, it's like, I really am kidding. I really am kidding. You're gonna come back, aren't you? Say you will, okay, good. Even if she's lying, I feel better. You know what I mean? Like, the thing is, bread isn't bread. Bread is anything in our lives that we rely on for satisfaction that belongs to God. Anything in our lives that we rely on for satisfaction that belongs to God. I was listening to a guy talk Friday night about a, at a concert, and this guy gets up and he's talking about um, his adoption of children in other countries, like that he, had, he was supporting other children. And he goes, that a couple of years ago, he goes, uh, I made a decision that the only way that I could really talk about going overseas and supporting children was to actually do it. And so for a month, this guy goes over to this remote village in Africa where no one speaks English. They speak Portuguese, Portuguese. <laughs> wow, Portuguese and something else. And he goes, I go over there and they couldn't communicate with me and I couldn't communicate with them and we had a really big challenge and we worked at that for a long time and we, you know, a week or so in, we were able to really kind of work with each other and talk to each other. What he was talking about is they were, the language they were using was emotional language, right? It was emotional language. It wasn't just talking. And he was talking about how much you had to really work on your words to say the most important thing you needed to say at that time. Like how selective you had to be with your words. And I was blown away. I was blown away with the depth of experience that he was willing to have with these children at the end of what gets me is, at the end of, the, um, at the end of the, his talk, he's putting up the conversation that Jesus is having about being naked and being hungry and being all those things. And it's like you had children coming up on the screen talking, doing that in English. And you're like, man, that's bread, isn't it? That's bread, like when it comes down to it, you gotta keep asking yourself, what is the bread that I need? Like, I know the bread that I want. I know the bread that I crave. I know the bread that I think is gonna be so, so good for me. But what is the bread that I actually need? We gotta always find ourselves in a position of shedding. Like, when I shed stuff, it's kinda like um, Charles Maynard, one of the pastors here, he talks about the fact that when he goes to, he goes to the end of the line of, of where you get on the, where you get on the Appalachian Trail, <clears throat> he goes in the first five miles, that's the best place ever to get a lot of loot. Because he goes, people leave backpacks, they leave really expensive coats, they leave tents, they leave big water bottles, they leave all kind of junk that you can't imagine. He goes, all you gotta do is go up there on a weekend and like pick it up. You know, he goes, it's, it's pretty good. It's like, we gotta be in that process, right? We gotta be in that process of shedding. We gotta learn how to be, we gotta learn how to be empty so that God can teach us how to be full. So let me ask you a question. Have you ever had an experience in your life where that exact thing happened to you, right? Where you got to a place of going, man, I don't think I could ever feel more empty than I feel right now. I don't think I could ever feel more alone than I feel right now. I don't think I could ever be more afraid than I, am, than I am right now. Have you ever had that experience? What's gonna happen next? God's gonna go, I want you to know what a very good place you're in. Because I want you to know that now I can start to talk to you. And right now I can start to fill you up. This whole thing of shedding is like, what do we do with being able to let go of stuff that isn't 
sufficient for us. We might think it's significant, but it's not sufficient. It will not keep us fed. It will not feed us in the way that Jesus feeds us. It will not feed us in the way that we need to be fully fed. That happens in, that happens in lots of marriages. That happens in lots of families where we just keep relying on one function after another function after another function after another function. And in the end, what we need is we gotta learn how to be fed, amen? We gotta learn how to let Jesus in. We gotta learn what the real bread is. Jesus goes, in John chapter six, he goes, let me tell you about bread. I'm the bread of life. And when you come and, and, when you come and eat this bread, you're never gonna be hungry again. Like, is the bread that you have that good? I'm not looking at you. Is the, bread, is the bread you have that good? Is the bread that I put into my life that good? Is what I think is that critical? Is it really that good? Is it really that good? Is it really gonna fill me? Is it really gonna change my life? Is it really gonna draw me to a place of unexplainable loving closeness to God? Is it gonna do that? Is it gonna put me in a place of, of real freedom? Is it gonna put me in a place of real sobriety, real sober living, real sober thinking? We're not just talking obviously about drugs and alcohol. Am I gonna to get to a place of legitimate sober living and legitimate sober dreaming of what God is gonna do in my life? When we decide that our bread is a gotta have and it's far more important than God's bread, we're in trouble, we're gonna miss we're gonna miss the significance of what God is trying to do, amen? And when we get there, we're gonna do everything possible <clears throat> to do the opposite of shedding. We wanna to try to hang on, we wanna to try to bolster things, we wanna to try to put things in a, you know, put things away in a pantry. Like, I, don't, I mean, I, I'm starting to discover that like two thirds of the stuff in my pantry we really don't need. I mean, like, you keep, it to, you keep it to, like, cook something or bake something twice a year. And, I mean, you really and truly don't need to, like, that pantry could become something else. It could become, and I don't know what, it could become a bedroom for a kid. I don't know, but, I mean, like, there's other stuff to do with that, amen? And, like, most of what I have in there, I don't really, I don't really need. I mean, like, uh, we, at one point, we went, um, we had to clean out Carol's mom's pantry. And so... There was stuff in that pantry that was from like 1820. I mean, there was. It was like, oh my goodness, man. That thing, is, that thing is older than you. How could you even have it? And we sit there and we like save it for a rainy day. It's like, to do what? What are we going to do with it? What are we really going to do with it? We got to learn how to shed in order to be ready. We got to be in that constant shedding process. I want, to, I want to give you another scripture, and this is what it says. It says, we are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but we are not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but we are never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. Through suffering, shedding, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus is also gonna be seen in our bodies. You know, the question really is gonna remain, do you need that? Why do you need that? It's like, it's like anything in my life that I say that I need that is more than God or in addition to God, I really gotta question, amen? I absolutely gotta start to question. I kinda gotta go, yeah, I'm enjoying that. Yeah, I believe that that's helpful. Yeah, I like that. You know, I like all that stuff. I mean, like, do I got to have it? Do I got to have it? And it's really not, it's really not a thing of, well, now we're going to spend, and now we're going to decide that we're going to bring everything, all of our stuff into this room, and we're going to give it all away, and we're going to go wait on a mountain for God to come. It's not like that at all. That's not really what we're doing. What I'm talking about, though, is it's not a, it's not a, it's not a, re, it's not a, a deal where, my inventory of stuff is gonna get challenged. It's really an attitude. It's really an availability. It's really how available am I, to, am I to God? How available am I actually to God? You know, that's what this is really about. The single 
litmus test here for God is that there's nothing that God has to prove, right? The single litmus test for God is at the foot of the cross. We constantly gotta figure out how to get there. When I start my day, I gotta get on my knees one way or another, and I gotta figure out, I gotta figure out how do I find myself at the foot of the cross of Jesus? How do I find myself right there? What do I have to do to be right there? What do I have to do to let everything else go and be right there? What needs to happen for me to be there? That's how we gotta start our day. We need to be there consistently. We need to be there constantly. When I spend more time at the cross, what's gonna happen to me is it's gonna eliminate the lie of the enemy that is a staple for him. What is the staple for him? God isn't doing enough for you. God isn't caring enough for you. God isn't loving you enough. God isn't providing for you enough. God is letting you down. God is your biggest disappointment. God isn't taking care of your mom. God isn't taking care of your dad. God isn't taking care of your son. God isn't taking care of your daughter. God isn't taking care of your marriage. God isn't taking care of your health or or your financial health or a hundred million other things. It's just God not doing it. We have to learn how to deal with and eliminate the lie of the enemy. We've got to learn how to not listen. And when we get to that cross, it's obvious, isn't it, how much Jesus loves us. When you get to that cross and you finally get on your knees, it's obvious what God is doing for you. When you get to that cross, you really are going to be able to solve the problem about who God is for you. Is God completely reliable? Is God completely trustable? Does God love you unconditionally? Is God God always on your side? If you can answer yes to all four of those, you're experiencing that bread of life that Jesus is talking about. You really are. If you're not certain of those, this is the best place to start, amen? This cross on your knees is the best place to start. I gotta look at it long enough to realize that what God did for me in Jesus, shedding his blood for me in Jesus, is the most important thing, the most loving thing God will ever do for me or anybody else in my entire life, amen? That's how it is. And where I start my day has everything to do with where I end my day. If I start my day at that cross, I'm gonna end my day at that cross. And I'm gonna know that whatever happens to me in between, in the end, it, it, it's, just not, it's just not necessary for me to obsess about that in comparison to what Jesus has already done for me, amen? So let's look at the next piece of this. The next, this is the next shot. Next, the devil takes him to a peak of a very high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. I will give it all to you, he says, if you will kneel down and worship me. Get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him. For the scriptures say, you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil went away and the angels came and took care of Jesus. The enemy can't give away what he doesn't already have. Your heart and my heart had one design, one design imprint on them. And the design imprint was stamped with the blood of Jesus. It was stamped with the imprint of Jesus. That's your only design, amen? That's my only design. When I begin to understand my identity in Jesus, I begin to understand that Jesus comes to live in me, he comes to be in my life, he comes to put that design on my heart, and that's my only design. And sometimes it's true that we gotta learn how to fight for our own hearts. We gotta learn how to fight for our own hearts. We gotta learn, we gotta learn what do I gotta do to fight for my heart? What's in my heart? Well, the stuff in my heart that's gotta go, I gotta look at that, obviously. You know, I'm gonna work on that. What does it mean for me to fight for my heart? It means like I gotta understand that at some point in my life I'm gonna be challenged. Maybe it's today. Someday I'm gonna wonder whether God 
is really all that good. Sometimes I'm gonna wonder whether God is really all that fair. Sometimes I'm gonna wonder whether God is really all that righteous. Sometimes I'm gonna wonder whether God can, can live up to what his promises are. Can he really say, can he really say, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you? Can he really deliver? Can he really deliver? Like, I have seen people that are so dead spiritually, they're so dead spiritually, they do not know which way is up, amen? Like, I've seen that a ton. And here's what I know. The one thing you can do is you can be willing, you can be willing to go in there and try to put your hands around your heart. And as soon as you start to do that, before you ever do that, you're gonna have God's hands meeting yours. And what's gonna happen is God is gonna move into your heart, right? And God is gonna start to speak into you. And lovingly in a way that, in a voice that's just gonna blow you away, God's gonna go, you know, do you think, do you think that today I can have your heart? Do you think I can have it today? Do you think I can have it today? Do you think I can take care of it today? Do you think I can love you in a way that you need to be loved today? Do you think I can remove the emptiness that you're in the middle of today? Do you think I can show you a far, far better way to live today? Do you think I can show you what it's like to have real bread today? Do you think I can show you what it's like to have a place where I can come and be with you no matter what and you'll never, you'll never need to be afraid again? Today, do you think that can happen today? It's gonna be up to you. I mean, you're gonna have to go, you know, yeah or no, I'm not ready to do that, God. You know, I wanna, I mean, basically what you're saying is, you're saying, you know, I really wanna suffer some more. You know, I choose to, I kinda wanna be alone. I don't really, I don't really necessarily want you around except when you're invited except when you're invited, except when I invite you in, then I'm good. Like, if I'm having a particularly good experience, I kind of want you to be there. I'm kind of okay with the idea of you being there. What about, what about God coming to a place in your life where he's coming into your heart and asking you, can I have this? Can I show you a free way to live? Can I show you a way to live where I'm gonna remove the fact that you're scared, the fact that you're embarrassed, the fact that you're afraid, the fact that you're guilty, the fact that you're ashamed? Shame has gotta be the most dangerous reality, emotional reality that there is. One of the things I know about shame for sure is we're not, try as we might, right, we're not gonna get it off ourselves. Try as we might, we're not getting shame off of ourselves. We're not gonna do it. It's gonna take the love and the blood of Jesus for that to happen. It's just going to. There's no, there's no like, well, there's a technique. If you look up the technique we have, and we have a hot shot technique, there's seven steps. Here's how we don't have that. We don't have that. Shame takes Jesus. The power of shame will only be overcome by the power of Jesus, amen? That is a fact. That's a fact. We get to a place where we, are, we find ourselves on the run from God. We get to a place where we find ourselves afraid of God. We get to a place where we find ourselves even maybe disappointed by God. Happens a lot. And what we tend to not wanna do is, that, that's probably gonna be the last conversation we have with somebody, amen, on this earth is like, we're so uncomfortable with the idea of saying, I just, want, I just thought I would share something right here. I thought I would share how disappointed I am in God. Like how many times have you, if you sat in a Bible study or you sat somewhere in a group somewhere and somebody actually said that out loud, you are in the right group, amen? You're in a loving, caring, open, safe group. Like it is rare that people are gonna say, talk about how disappointed they are in God. It is rare. It is rare. Why do we feel the need to test God? We feel the need to test God because we're unconvinced of how much he loves us. We're unconvinced of this cross. There's, a, there's another part to this story that talks about, it talks about everything that, um, every single thing that Jesus did in his challenge with the enemy coming down to, you know, yet another dare. It's an I dare you. And this talks about, 
this talks about, the story goes on to go, Jesus and, uh, Jesus and the enemy are up on this, up on this high mountain, and uh, the enemy goes, if you're such a hot shot, if, you, if you're just so good at what you do, if you, if you have so much confidence in God, throw yourself off the cliff, the angels will take care of you. Dare ya, dare ya. Jesus goes, I don't need to dare God for any reason. I already know how much he loves me. Takes all the power away from the enemy. Look at, you and I have the exact same power, amen? We have the exact same authority. We have the exact same opportunity to be able to say to the enemy, I've got you and I reject you and I reject everything about you and I reject your lies. I reject your lies. And I do all of that in the name of Jesus. He tells, the enemy tells Jesus to jump. Jesus goes, never gonna happen. Never gonna happen. There are gonna be days for us when our, we're gonna find ourselves in drift. When we find ourselves in drift, we're gonna, it's gonna be subtle. We're gonna be like a step away and then a step away and then a step away and I'm not really, I really feel like somehow I'm disconnected from God, but somehow I'll get it back. And then like I'm a step away and a step away and a step away. And now pretty, pretty, pretty soon, I'm a long ways away. And what am I gonna do? I'm gonna sit down at a meal. And I'm, gonna, I'm gonna use, I'm gonna sit at a table and I'm gonna enjoy the bread of God. I'm gonna sit down at a meal and I'm gonna enjoy the bread of life. I'm gonna sit down at a meal and I'm gonna enjoy what real freedom and real fullness and real sustenance is like. And once I know it, once I know it, I'm gonna never, I'm gonna never be able to find a way not to wanna have it, amen? Once I know that, once I know what it's like to be actually and fully free, I'm not gonna be able to get enough of it. It's just kind of the way it's gonna go. It's gonna be that good for me. Jesus is showing us what it's like never to take shortcuts. Don't be deceived, he's telling us, by the, the lame bread that you're being offered that you're creating on your own. Don't be deceived by it. Don't ever give the enemy ownership over something that you have ownership over or that Jesus has ownership over. Tells him, man, I'm in charge of the world. It's like, no, you're not. I rule the world, I rule the kingdom. No, you don't. I'm gonna be able to give you the keys to the kingdom. No, you can't. All that is absolutely untrue. One of our hardest problems is, is we wanna find some kind of a way to share sovereignty with ourselves, don't we? We wanna try to find some way to go, I want a little piece of my godness in me, I wanna have some God stuff going on in me, but I also wanna be, I also wanna have God come to me when I need him. It's like they're in room for both of us in the same seat, amen? You gotta decide what seat is God really gonna be in, and is it gonna be just God? Is it gonna be just God? Has God earned the right in your life based on the blood of the cross of Jesus to be able to be owned, the only God in your life, yes or no? Is that true or is that false? Has God earned the right based on the blood of Jesus to be the only God in your life? There's no shortcuts there. That's a tough question. Those are tough questions, aren't they? This bread question is tough. Who is in charge of your life is tough. Are you daring God is tough. What is God trying to speak into you today? How is God trying to set you free today? What kind of life is God trying to give you today? What kind of design does he have on you today? Man, we're gonna pray and, and uh, you can come up here and pray at any of these places right here where these pads are. You can pray about whatever you like. If you wanna talk about Jesus, I'll be right down here. If you've given your life over to something else other than him, stop today. Stop today. You can be entirely free this morning. Let's pray. Sweet Jesus, thank you so much for this time, the opportunity to speak your truth, the opportunity to come and be loved by you. We love you so much. In your sweet name we pray, amen. Thank you so much, amen.